Uh, this is cross-channel um, visual prediction. Okay, so much of the progress in recent years in computer vision has been driven by this machinery that we know as deep learning. And deep nets have been particularly adept at discriminative modeling, that is, um, regressing from some sort of um, images to some sort of hand-curated um, labels. And we've seen that not only can um, it directly solve the um, primary task, for example, of digit recognition or of uh, recognizing natural objects or even you know, per-pixel tasks, um, it can also, the, the representations that are learned also generalize to other tasks as well. However, this pipeline um, requires the use of labels, which can be expensive to obtain or maybe even induce some sort of unwanted bias in the representations. So another segment of the community has focused on generative modeling. And one way to test these generative models um, is to try to draw samples from them. And what we see is that uh, for data sets such as for digits, these can look very nice. Um, but for natural images, while the results are getting better you know, month by month, the results still quite aren't there. Um, so the utility of these generative models um, aren't, haven't been shown to be as useful as in the um, discriminative modeling. So we work, um, so our work is somewhere kind of in the middle, uh, where we're working to do data prediction or conditional data prediction. Um, and so we've seen a few talks in the seminar series uh, kind of in this line of work. So we've seen um, Deepak present about inpainting. Uh, we've seen Andrew Owens present about generating um, sound synthetically from a video stream. And we've seen uh, the pix to pix work from Philip Pisola. And there's also um, a cool follow-up work called PsychoGAN um, that was just recently released. And in this regime, we hope to um, directly solve graphics tasks. So instead of doing labeling tasks, we can do graphics. And number two, um, we'd also like to um, use this as a way of learning about the natural kind of visual world. So one task that we've um, spent a lot of effort in is this, this task of automatic image colorization. So here, we're looking to associate um, the grayscale channel or L channel. And um, using that, we want to predict the AB or color information. And if we're able to successfully do this, we can concatenate the output and the input and hopefully get a plausible colorization um, of the grayscale image. And we learned this mapping with the CNN. Now we note that um, by, per by doing this problem, we have um, a free supervisory signal. After all, any color image can be broken up into its grayscale and color components. And hopefully by doing this task, we can actually uh, learn a network that internally has semantics or perhaps even some higher level abstractions. Um, so we trained the system on uh, a million ImageNet um, color images. And then as kind of a way to test it, we, we looked at how well it did on legacy black and white photos. Um, so if we look at this iconic photograph of Yosemite Valley Bridge from Ansel Adams, we can imagine that perhaps the sky is blue, um, the mountain is maybe brown, and the vegetation is most certainly green. And our system does something pretty reasonable with, with this photograph. Uh, we can also try it on an extinct animal. And actually, this has been in the news recently, so maybe we'll get to actually uh, check this against ground truth, if we're lucky. Um, this is a photo of uh, my father and my great-grandfather from the 50s. And this is a professional photograph from Henry cartier Bresson. And we also put this on the internet, um, and people had kind of some fun with it. So here's um, a dog that was just taken out for a color run. And if you push it through our system, we actually predict kind of a more prototypical cleaned up appearance for the dog. Or if we have colorfully tiled Yoda, um, we can also make him kind of green. We've also seen kind of some fun message board exchanges. So here's an example of Muhammad Ali. Someone got excited and said, wow, this turned out really well. Someone asked the kind of scientific question of how does the system know, you know, you know what race he is? Um, it turns out what we call race is actually um, not actually in the chroma channels, but mostly in the lightness channel. So people are still um, black or white and black and white pictures. So that's kind of an interesting scientific point. Uh, oops, that just occurred to me. And then it goes a little off the rails. So how does it know if someone's Asian? People are still Asian in black and white photos, no only in black and white and Asian photos. OK, um, so we were looking through the results. And we saw that um, sometimes the system makes kind of some curious mistakes or maybe some inf ha has some informative biases. So if we look at this picture of a dog and we push it through our system, we see this kind of um, curious artifact here, right, where there's this um, pink blob right under the face of the dog. And we were actually really perplexed by, by this at first until we flipped through the training set. And we saw that almost all the dogs in the ImageNet training set have their mouths open and, and their tongues out. So even when their mouth is closed, um, 
the network is happy to hallucinate a tongue for us. Um, and this was kind of encouraging because if we actually look at the original black and white image, there's nothing really to indicate that this patch or pixel should be um, any more pink than something on its code. So that really indicates to us that perhaps um, the network is looking at something that's you know, kind of a higher level concept, such as dog faces. And so we wanted to kind of peel away at the internals of the network and see how it was solving the colorization task. So one way that we can qualitatively get at this is um, look at the images that maximally activate certain hidden units within the network. And so this is a technique that was um, presented in iClear 2015 by um, Bolezo. And what we see is that in one of the internal layers, uh, many of the units correspond to thing categories, such as sky, trees, and water. And there are other, oh, sorry, those are subcategories, and the, there are other units that correspond to more thing categories, such as faces, dog faces, and flowers. And note that the network was able to discover these units uh, without the aid of any kind of supervised um, supervisory uh, supervised data or hand-carried labels. It was able to find this just by um, training for the task of colorization itself. And so we wanted to actually quantitatively measure how semantic or higher level the representations that we learned actually were. So to do this, we um, froze all of the layers weights. We trained linear classifiers on top as kind of a simple read-off to see how linearly separable the feature space was. And then we plotted this um, with respect to uh, the layer. So the x-axis here is each layer of the network, and the y-axis is top one accuracy. And so it's doing one of a thousand way image net classification. And we get uh, a curve like this. So it starts off low, and as you go deeper into the network, um, it gets more and more abstract until it, it peaks at some um, internal layer. And we took this and we actually compared to previous um, unsupervised or self-supervised methods as well. Um, so what we see here is the bottom curve is if you do a Gaussian initialization. So this is no pre-training at all. And the other curves are um, kind of previous self-supervision methods. So we have uh, in-painting or relative patch prediction, or um, this pink curve is a generative model called uh, Bygans from Jeff Donahue at all. Um, and what we see is that our method is actually um, very competitive, even state of the art, compared to these other self-supervised methods. And this was kind of um, a surprise to us because we were at first um, very focused on the graphics task. And then we saw this result come out um, after, the, after we trained for, for graphics. Now the top curve is if you do uh, supervised pre-training. So that's uh, kind of an oracle or something we hope to eventually match or maybe even beat uh, with lots of data if we can. Okay, so for um, supervised training, we can train a network and learn a feature hierarchy that goes from ImageNet images to ImageNet labels, for example. Now our method is an example of something that's uh, called self-supervised or unsupervised learning. And what we do is we take the input, we break it up into two pieces, and then we learn a feature hierarchy that actually is trained to regress from one piece of the input to the other. And it's been kind of a recent flurry of activity in this, in this line. But actually, we went back and we dug through um, literature and found kind of an earlier reference by Virginia Dessau from NIPS 1994. And the idea of this paper is that if you can associate um, imagery with sound, for example, if you can associate the raw pixels of a cow with the raw audio waveform of the sound moo, then you've uh, perhaps learned something abstract or high level about the natural world. And so we've seen a more modern take of this by Andrew Owens, as well as a lot of work um, using different types of signals, such as ego motion, um, context, co-occurrence, and video cues. And so these are all kind of tradition, what we call self-supervised methods. Uh, but these are actually not too unrelated from more traditional unsupervised methods, such as autoencoders and denoising autoencoders. And the point of um, kind of all this work is to set up or engineer some sort of pre-training scheme which tricks the network underneath to learn a useful representation. Now, if we look at um, autoencoders, which is kind of a traditional um, unsupervised learning method, um, there the proposal is to train a network that looks to reproduce a signal from itself. Now, of course, you can just put a um, trivial identity function in the middle here. So in order to force the abstraction, uh, one has to kind of add a bottleneck or some sort of sparsity constraint. And that way, the abstraction can be induced uh, through this um, compression objective. Uh, but here it seems the, what we've seen is that the network is not working hard enough. So follow-up work um, is on, on autoencoders is 
um, using denoising autoencoders. So there the input is randomly corrupted in some stochastic IID way, and the network is uh, trained to try to undo this, this random corruption. And hopefully this will uh, make the network work a little bit harder. Is the microphone? No. Okay, so here it's looking to induce abstraction um, through a reconstruction objective instead. Um, so our system is actually pushing this concept in uh, kind of a harder, a harder way. Um, so instead of a random stochastic corruption, what we do is we um, add a systematic um, modification to the signal. That is, we take the signal and we drop out um, half of it and use it as a label for the network to predict. And so this is actually really forcing, instead of re reconstruction, it's forcing the network to um, induce subtraction through prediction, which hopefully works better. Okay, good. Okay, so here we're looking to induce um, abstraction through prediction, and we find that we actually get very strong performance um, in this kind of cross-channel paradigm. Um, but there's a problem here, right? So if we look at this diagram, in the end, we're extracting features um, just from X1. And while we were using X2 during training, it gets thrown away during test time. So we're essentially blind to the signal on X2. And so in the case of colorization, the uh, network is quite literally colorblind. And so perhaps there's some way to, to remedy this. And this is what we came up with. So we have one half of the network that does the original colorization or um, the primary cross-channel task. And we can have a second half of the network um, do the opposite. So this is actually predicting the grayscale component from the, um, the chroma. And then when we extract the features, we can actually concatenate these two representations and get features on the whole signal itself. So this hopefully will leave nothing on the table. And if we actually take a step back and look at um, the scheme we've um, produced, we see that the aggregate of the inputs and the outputs are actually the whole signal itself. And if you kind of stand back and squint and draw a box around this, we actually see that it is an autoencoder. It has basically the same objective as the autoencoder. And so we gave it kind of a fun name, so we call it split brain autoencoders. Um, and this is kind of a call to an older um, NIPS paper called Optimal Brain Damage. And so um, we applied this for images. So here we're going from grayscale to color and also color to grayscale. And we can also apply this technique to any kind of signal that's a, that's a tensor. So we can also take an RGBD um, signal from a connect and predict the depth channels from the uh, color channel or the image channels and vice versa. We can do pre-training on RGBD images in this way as well. Okay, so we went back and looked at um, our feature learning test, and we saw that um, this is what we got from the colorization cross-channel encoder, and the split-brain autoencoder actually gives us kind of an, a nice boost on top. And now we can actually um, see that it's, it's um, a good level above previous um, unsupervised or self-supervised methods. Okay, we also looked at how well the method generalized to other data sets and other tasks. So we also looked at um, places classification. So places is a large scale um, scene recognition database. And we also looked at um, how well it did on Pascal classification detection, where Pascal is kind of a smaller or medium scale data set. Um, so we saw that for places or for scenes, uh, the split brain did kind of well competitive um, compared to previous methods as well. Um, meanwhile, on Pascal, what we have plotted here is two different tasks. So the y-axis is detection, and the x-axis is classification. And so we note that um, the cross-channel encoder, or the split-brain autoencoder, does um, kind of state-of-the-art on classification, whereas for detection, actually, uh, kind of maybe more structured tasks, such as um, watching objects move, which we saw from Deepak a few weeks ago, or a relative context from Carl Dorsch, uh, performs better. So perhaps there's something kind of complementary being learned um, between these different types of um, self-supervision methods. Um, what we also see is that supervised pre-training, which we hope to match someday, is all the way up into the right there. And while we're making progress between uh, kind of random Gauss initialization 
and um, supervised pre-training, we still have a long way of, um, to go and a lot of ground to, to make up here. Okay, so we've kind of alluded to the relationship between um, this work and autoencoder, so I like to make that comparison a little bit more explicit. Um, so if we train this network uh, with the autoencoder objective, we get the curve uh, shown in the pink down here. If we add 50% input dropout, so this is something like uh, denoising autoencoders, uh, we get a small boost, so the network does have to work harder, uh, but it kind of gives it 1% to 2% there. Whereas for our um, split brain autoencoder, we get kind of this uh, much larger boost in, in performance. And actually, the split brain and the denoising autoencoder uh, in both, um, in both um, networks there, they're trying to make up 50, approximately 50% 50 of the data. Um, but forcing, it to, forcing the network to do it in this kind of uh, more abstract way seems to uh, give higher performance. And lastly, we, um, what I haven't touched on yet is the loss function that's actually used to train the network. So these curves here are all with um, regression losses. And this curve up here is with the classification loss. So what we do is we take the output space, and instead of uh, making a point estimate, we quantize the output space and predict a distribution over that output space. And this kind of indicates that um, having a richer label space um, also gives you kind of a boost in, in performance as well. And so if we actually think about the nature of the colorization task itself, it is something that is multimodal um, and something that perhaps it helps to model. So if we take this example grayscale image of a migrant mother and we try to color, think about what it might look like in color, uh, it might look like something like this. But the shirts could be different, and the backgrounds could be different as well. Um, so we could get something like this instead, or maybe this. And um, there have been kind of some large-scale uh, methods that do colorization in an automatic way, um, such as our work in ECCV, um, but there's also Izuka et al. and SIGGRAPH and uh, Gustav Larsen as well. Um, but all these techniques can only really hope to pick out um, one mode for the color. And if the user sees some sort of artifact or they don't like that mode, there's nothing they can really do about it. So what we went and uh, tried to develop is some sort of interface that allows the user to interact with the system. So what we have here is um, the input and the output. Um, and for this cup, we're going to add a point on, on the cup. And adding that point um, allows us to um, really colorize the cup any, anything that we want. So condition on that point, we can flip it between you know, blue, red, and green. And we can also um, take this point and drag it through um, the AB gamut. And so this is work that we've um, just submitted to, to SIGGRAPH about a half hour ago, um, the final version at least. OK. Um, so what we did like about the previous automatic work was that we were able to learn from large scale data and that it was fast, because it was just a feed forward pass of the network. But of course, the user had no control, so they couldn't select a mode or they couldn't go and fix artifacts. There's also been um, very seminal work from uh, Levin et al. Uh, and the idea here is that you're given a grayscale image, and you can draw strokes on top of it. And using kind of lower level texture or um, brightness cues or affinity measures, we can then take um, these strokes and propagate them to the rest of the image. And this actually works extremely well. It's uh, very robust. Uh, but one kind of difficulty is um, this propagation rule has to be hand-defined um, in some way. And also, um, there's no prior knowledge in the system about natural images. So if you know, the, the image is of some vegetation, we know that it's likely to be green. But under this um, regime, the user still has to go and explicitly define that. So ideally, we'd like to kind of combine the best of both worlds here. So we'd like to be able to um, learn the edit propagation from large-scale data. So one way you go about this problem is uh, we put a deep network in the middle. We have our inputs and our outputs, and we let our deep network do the work. So we have a grayscale image. We have uh, sparse user points, and then we have an output. Now, this output is just from the grayscale image, and it's a little bit uncertain about what color this uh, orange could be, so it's kind of dull. But now if the network gets to, um, gets to see the single pixel, if we tell the network that the top left pixel is orange, it really um, resolves the ambiguity here in, in the output. And indeed, if we do that, it's happy to fill in the, the rest of the image for us. OK, so one challenge in um, actually training a deep network is how to actually acquire the data. 
So for automatic colorization, it was easy enough. We could just go on the internet and download a bunch of color images and we were good to go. Um, but in this interactive case, it's not as clear how to get the, um, get the data. Do we sit down, have users sit down and colorize you know, millions of images? Um, that's gonna be a little expensive. And perhaps even more difficult, there's a chicken and egg problem. So the way that the users will actually interact with the system depends on how the system behaves. Um, and we can't you know, get a good system without um, training data either. So we were actually able to bypass this problem um, by randomly simulating these user points. And we found that the workspace was actually low enough that this random, um, randomly drawing these points actually worked. So what we do is um, we first randomly figure out, we randomly draw how many points we're going to reveal to the system. And then we take those points and locate them randomly in the image and we reveal those kind of ground truth points um, to the network. And then we train the network to try to reproduce the, um, the, the ground truth image there. Okay, so kind of as a sanity check, we wanted to see how well the network um, propagated these points. Um, so we note that if you just predict gray for every single pixel, um, you get about 23 PSNR. And this is where uh, kind of the um, edit propagation techniques such as Levin et al. will start from. If you give the system no points, it'll just give uh, a gray answer. Um, so our system, even when you give it no points, it's doing automatic colorization. So it knows that the sky is blue and the grass is probably green. Um, and it kind of has these, these concepts already embedded. So it starts off a little bit higher. And then what we do is we're going to randomly re reveal ground truth points to the system. And so we have that on the x-axis on a log scale. And then we have PSNR plot on the y scale. So um, this is a log-log plot. And so for 11 system, we see that um, as you reveal points, um, the PSNR will increase uh, approximately linear linearly. Um, so it's able to continuously incorporate information, uh, which is really great. And that's um, kind of behavior that we desire in our system as well. And so for our system, we, we get this blue curve up here. So we see that with uh, very few points, um, our system has um, higher accuracy than Levin et al. Um, and also it's monotonically increasing, which means that it can continuously take in more and more user input. And what we see is that on the very right, actually these two curves will intersect at around 500 points. Um, and this kind of makes sense to us because if we give 500 points to um, the system, basically um, low, mid to high level knowledge isn't um, as necessary. You can um, perhaps just use low level kind of edit propagation then to, to fill in the rest of the pixels. Uh, but for a kind of uh, fast to medium kind of interaction with the image, uh, we're going to be in this regime. So this is kind of a nice um, performance gap. And so this indicates to us that if we provide the correct colors to the system, it's able to successfully propagate those, those points forward. But actually one challenge that we found is um, how to get the user to actually select those good points um, themselves. And so um, what we do is instead of, of it, well, in addition to just, um, in addition to primarily predicting the colorization, we also have a side task of predicting a distribution for every pixel of uh, what that pixel color might be. So we're solving a classification problem as we're going. Um, so we can, instead of uh, just taking the, uh, doing a point estimate in an AB space, we also basically we quantize the AB space and do a classification over these, um, these 300 or so bins. And what might that actually look like? So here we have um, this plot of an AB gamut. Each one of these tiles um, is one of the bins in the AB space. And regions with high lightness indicate um, high probability of that pixel being that color as predicted by the network. And what we see is that uh, for this bird, the network will predict that the bird is likely to be blue, red, or maybe purple. And the background vegetation is probably green, yellow, or maybe a little bit brown. And so to the user, um, what we give them is um, some sort of interface where um, if they click on this point here, we'll show them possible um, colors that um, this bird could be. And if they click on any of these points, uh, the system will, will fill in the um, bird with that color, hopefully. And so we can see that the user can kind of flip through these different modes in kind of an efficient manner. And something we like to see is um, this kind of beh behavior here on this uh, red and yellow bird. Uh, because we actually see that the, the points we provided were actually just green on the vegetation and uh, red on the bird. 
But the system actually knew um, from learning from you know, millions of images that um, this red actually goes nicely with yellow as well. So even though we didn't explicitly tell it this point is yellow, it was able to kind of infer that um, by learning from data. Okay, so we ran a user study where we had um, users sit down with kind of minimal training and we had the um, play with our system for, for a minute. And here are some kind of fun results that we got. So here's the grayscale image. Here's our result um, in an automatic fashion with no user input. And then after a minute, um, the user came in and decided that they wanted kind of red peppers up top, green peppers in the middle, and yellow peppers on the bottom. And so in a minute, they were able to go from this automatic result to kind of a more reasonable, colorful result. Um, and here's the kind of output from the uh, Levin system. So it's a little more difficult for uh, just by low-level cues to take these points and propagate them as cleanly. Okay, so here's a, another result. So the automatic result is on the right. Um, the user wanted um, kind of some more red and yellow, and our system was able to take this and, and propagate it uh, through, the, through the image. And here's the 11 results. So things like these kind of thin structures may be a little more difficult. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a little hard to compare. So that's why we also had the edit propagation test. Um, but it's true, it, these were collected with our system, so it'll give us an advantage. Um, but our system also has the advantage of being um, real time, and we provide kind of color recommendations as well. Um, but that's true, this isn't 100% you know, fair to, to Levin. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we also looked at kind of recolorization. So if we want to remove someone's tan, we can take kind of a less saturated um, portion of the, um, of the color and color um, the rest of the face in, in that manner as well. Okay, um, so one thing to note is we trained this just with uh, ground truth color. So we wanted to see if it could actually generalize to unusual colorizations as well. So we took this elephant and we decided to put some pink points on top. We wanted a pink elephant. And now the system has seen um, elephants before, not this particular one, but it has seen elephants, but it's never seen them in combination with these pink points. Um, and if you push it through our system, it's actually um, able to follow the user guidance and actually fill in the rest of the segment um, with this color as well. And this indicates that it's learned to kind of trust the user and to take those user points and, and try to um, propagate them through the segment. And we can also make um, this, actor, this actor's face green as well. Okay, um, so finally we took the system and we wanted to see if we could take in other hints as well. So instead of taking kind of local user points, we also took in um, a global histogram. Um, and so we wanted to see if we can use this end-to-end -end approach with any kind of marginal statistics um, of the output. Um, so we'll skip over the network, but here's kind of the result. So we're trying to do kind of the style transfer thing. So given this input image, we wanted the color histogram uh, from the top right here. And here are the results we get. So this is kind of another way of flipping through the multiple modes or possible colorizations of this image. And here's one more result. Okay, um, so we've kind of covered a few papers. So we have more information on our website. Um, this one's getting built soon. Hopefully we'll have a demo up in a week. Thank you.